Yes. Okay. Well, I'll I'll introduce you all to my wonderful, wonderful friend Leanne Heinbaugh, who um, <laughs> it, I like. Really, she needs no introduction because she's going to tell you uh, who she is and what she does, and and then give us some insight about the pandemic and what the culture that she lives within feels about it and and all of that but uh i just want to say she's amazing she does these wonderful wonderful workshops in um santiago de atitlan in guatemala and um they're life-changing for many many people so um it's something that maybe you know, if you if you've never considered it, it might be something you want to consider. Because I have to say, I've done it, I've done it twice, and uh, and I feel, you know, different every time I go. So, without further ado, my friend Leanne, yay! Thanks Hi. for joining us, Leanne. <laughs> Good morning. So um, in talking to Wendy, and thanks for having me, it's always fun to share with other cool chicks around the globe, right, especially now, um, is uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I would love it if we could kind of go around uh, once you know a little bit more about me, and if you have specific questions or curiosities to let me know so we can kind of steer things a bit. Um, so the short version is I was born in... Uh, in a very conservative uh, all-white farm town in Indiana, USA. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just always had this inkling that there was something more. And so at 13, my mom and I took one of those horrible um, like tourist apple tours, if anybody remembers those out of Chicago back in the day, um, to Cancun, Mexico. And while we were there, we jumped on a bus with like 40 other tourists and went to Tulum, which was a Mayan ruins. And in my small farm town, I had been reading anything indigenous after anything. It just, I knew there was something more out there. So this was my first foray into the world. Where I'm from, <laughs> we rarely left our county. So to fly internationally was kind of a big deal. Um, and we went to the Mayan ruins of Tulum and much longer story, but I was hooked, um, kind of fell in love. And so then fast forward a bit, uh, 1980s, new age, woo woo stuff, you know, bookstores and spiritual things and lots of fun stuff going on. And uh, my mom was also one from our, uh, she was born and raised and lived in the same hometown I, I was. Um, I knew there was something more. And so she started going to kind of workshops, retreats, different things. And um, she speaks fluent Spanish. So when one of the men who was kind of leading groups and workshops decided he was going to go to Mexico, my mom said, I'll go because he spoke no Spanish. Um, and so off they went. Um, through a series of events, I began to kind of work with him as well and then started traveling with them all through uh, southern Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and each place I'd go, um, it just felt, it felt both really exciting and foreign and like I was going home. Um, and again, longer story short, but I was really blessed because throughout those travels through, through Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras, um, over time I was taken in by elders in the different indigenous communities. And in Central Latin America, it's very much like the, the US and Canada, right? Is there's different tribes, groups that are mostly identified by language <clears throat> and by tradition. So. Um, I was I was blessed to to learn and kind of begin to study with probably 15 different uh, elders throughout uh, the years and then ultimately landed where my home is now, although I'm not there, in Santiago Atitlan, Guatemala, which is a Mayan indigenous town in the mountains. Um, it's known as one of the most uh, traditional Mayan towns still in Guatemala. There are a couple of others. Um, and I joke, but it's true, and Wendy can testify, it's a little bit like the Wild West in a way, right? Would you say, Wendy? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, especially when you're taking public transportation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so about 15 years ago, I kind of stopped traveling anywhere else and landed there and um, got adopted. And what I should kind of share with people, too, is as a child, I dreamt things, I saw things, I knew things, and where I'm from, um, 
that was not a good thing. <laughs> Creativity, intuition, things like that were not encouraged. In fact, they were, um, in, my, in my upbringing, you know, Protestants weren't supposed to mix with Catholics. That was bad, right? So any little kid or child who saw or felt things like that, um, you learn both directly and tacitly not to talk about it. Um, but it wasn't until I was a teen and my mom started those adventures and um, Conrad, who's the man she was traveling with, uh, looked at my mom one day and said, you know, your daughter sees stuff and you know, she feels things and you know, she's, she's, she's got a gift in there. Now, what I knew was I had had night terrors for 12 years and not slept because I felt saw all these things would happen to me and I had no way of making sense of them other than, you know, in the Western culture to think that maybe I was crazy, maybe it would pass. Um, and we had mental illness, an elder sibling of mine and my family. So that kind of expounded. So I share that in that <clears throat> the elders that I met along the road are the ones who just uh, embraced me and let my, helped me figure out what, what it means to have my normal be normal. And so now when I'm not stuck in quarantine in Arizona, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, I'm taking care of my mom who's here for cancer treatments. Um, I live full time in, a, in an indigenous Mayan town in Santiago. Um, and that's, that's home quite a ways from my, my little Indiana roots. Um, so any, that's kind of the general of how I came to be. And I think what it is for me is that I think our goal in life is to let our normal be normal, right? is mm. to find where it is that you live and how you live, that your normal is normal. So like for me, it's really interesting being in the States is, uh, I'm adjusting back. It's not that I've forgotten. This is not my easy normal, right? This is actually, I'm in a, I was telling Patty, I'm, I'm in a golf club community in Arizona, like a wealthy homogenous, everything matches stucco. This is so weird to me. <laughs> like I, I go out walking and I'm kind of disoriented. Everything looks the same. Um, so it's interesting how um, we explore life in our travels or our homes and, and what each of us do. And that uh, I think part of our journey is where we land being, being home, where our normal can be normal. And that's not always a location. Um, that's the people, the communities, the, the way we create it. But uh it's been a really fun journey and clearly it's, it's continuing for all of us. So Leanne, I see that you're wearing something traditional. So can, yeah. you, can you tell us about, and, and you know, I think you're, it's probably something that grounds you, right? You're in a very unfamiliar place and, but you're wearing something that is, that you would wear if you were at home. So tell us about that. Yeah. Um, so this is the only one I brought with me because uh, this wasn't the plan. So um, <laughs> one of the things that I love about uh, my adopted home community, which we say, by the way, Sutuki, which is like saying Navajo or Cherokee. It's the, the Mayan uh, group I live with, with and in. Um, all the traditional clothes are woven on a backstrap loom. So particularly as women, it's really interesting because picture yourself, so you'd be sitting and you'd have your loom, which is a really long, the backstrap loom, and then it would be tied to a tree up there. So you'd have all these threads down and then you would sit squatted with all your different pieces of that loom and move them back and forth. So the motion it makes is like a rocking motion, right? So even the forming of fabric like this is the same as a woman giving birth. That's like the birth contractions and you're tied to the tree of life. So in our traditions, even weaving, we don't say something is woven, we say it is born, hmm. right? And, <laughs> yeah. That's don't so cool. <laughs> I think that's crazy, that's cool. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? It mm -hmm. is. Um, and so when it's born and, you know, again, you got that, that loom out in front of you. So this is its head up towards the tree of life and the body and the feet, which are down by your pelvis, right? And so each thread in there and each, it's a very complex loom. There's like, don't quote me on this. Do you have there's a like picture of it? Different... This loom, by the way, sorry to interrupt. Do you have yeah. a picture of this loom? What's it called? We can look it up maybe. Back, called a backstrap. Backstrap, yeah. 
I was gonna say, let's see if I, <clears throat> I don't have anything. So normally I'd have, I'd have paintings on my wall to show you. It's a backstrap loom. So it's all the threads going this way and there's a, a bar up above and bar down below. And depending on what somebody's weaving, it's usually about a six or seven foot long. Uh, oh, oh yeah. Resh. Is that what? Uh, you look up Mayan back. Yep, that's it. Got it. Amy's got it. That's it. Uh huh. And you you actually see these all over. You see people, uh, yeah. You see people weaving like all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's not unusual. Yeah. This this here. I'm gonna this we peel is actually not from my town, but I'm gonna show you. So this is actually three backstrap looms. So from here. Right there, out, that's one piece like you just saw in that loom. This is another one. And then this is a third, right? Mm -hmm. And this is double, it's all one piece, right? So it's woven and then doubled over. So when they're weaving, that's why it's that long, right? So what they say, hang with me a second. So you've got the head, the body and the feet and it, the weaving is born. And so again, remember the woman is rocking like this. It's a, of giving birth, right? It's contract, release, contract, release. And the women in my town also wear a headdress that is a big, like 16 meter long like belt that weaves around your head. That's the glow of grandmother moon. I'll find a picture and show you. Um, it's called a tokoyal. So, the reason I'm sharing this is because as women, it's pretty cool. So here you are weaving and making these clothes. You're giving birth, right? The process of giving birth to the cloth. Now on this one, in my town, it's all birds because our, the name of our town is Tkin Chai, which means house of the birds. But this one's a beautiful old uh, example. So all of these images, now on this one, these are woven in here, they're not embroidered. So imagine as you're weaving, there's a counting process, like a ritual. It's nearly, when you do it, it's like a meditation. There's a counting process that the children, the girls learn from when they're young with their grandmothers and mothers. So this is actually woven in there. That's not embroidered. So what it means is, and when there's a real mastery, check this out. You don't see a thread on the back. Mm. One of the reasons is this is the creation story that gets to be adorned upon you that meets the physical world. This is the creation story. See these lines? These are the seasons and the cycle of the moon, grandmother moon, who's the great midwife. So as women, this gets worn against your physical body and your story gets told to the world of what the creation story is. So all of these symbols on this one are like the roads, the planting, the cardinal points, the stars. This is like a cosmology, right? And then you would have a skirt that goes with this that is full of symbols also. Everything, and it depends on your town, right? Um, ours has just tons and tons of symbols, corn seeds and corn stalks and candelabras, which are the way we do ceremony, lighting the heart of life, moon cycles, seed cycles, and it's just chock full. Sadly, I don't have mine with me, but what it is is that when those weavings are born, the skirts are foot loomed, actually, but when those are born, what it is is as women, you give birth, these cloths are given birth to, then you adorn yourself in these as the seated replacement of the grandmothers before you, right? Because in Mayan culture, um, the, the Mero, mero, how do you say that? The main tree of life, there are many, right? As there are in most cultures, is corn, maize. So uh, the way the, old, the elders teach us is that from one seed comes many, right? So we're the granddaughters, in this case, of the grandmothers before us, because from one seed we were planted and grew, and one of the seeds that came out of that is us. <laughs> and so it's our work as women to carry, we say, the fingers, eyes, toes, and nose, the wisdoms of the grandparents. Our parents in this are intermediaries. We come through them, right? So when we're out planting our seeds and flowering in the world, one of the ways that we, 
we know and we adorn ourselves is to actually daily dress yourself in the creation story of what it is to be a woman and to represent that lineage from the beginning of time and to pass it on for the future young women to carry it all so that the world continually gets planted. Wow. It's <laughs> beautiful. Uh -huh. Makes my t-shirt feel really stupid right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> one of the things that, that's interesting about it is that, um, and again, I'm very clear both within myself and in, in life in general is that to judge one culture against another is a bad idea because nobody wins there, right? Is we, we live in different cultures, evolution happens, things change. I do, however, believe that there is a gift in remembering what it is to adorn oneself rather than to have a bunch of shit. <laughs> like, I got my favorite t-shirts too. I have, you know, it, it's not, I don't think we want to judge it, but it is a very different relationship that you have with life when what you say is, and frankly, particularly in our Western culture, because there is so much crap around body image too. And let me just tell you, when you wear these, you sew them up to fit you and you take it out and you fix it if you get skinny or fatter and you don't care and the skirt doesn't have any seams, you put a belt and cinch that bad boy, it's awesome. <laughs> but <laughs> is the other part of the womanhood in this, and it is changing um, in my town and others because technology, the outside world, Facebook, all that stuff has made its way in, right? Um, but it's interesting there. So instead of saying, oh, someone must be skinny, there are things that they say like, ooh, si hay hueso sin carne, el sabor no, no es igual. It's like saying if somebody's really skinny and it's all bones and no meat, there's not a lot of flavor. <laughs> and they would also say, for instance, um, oh, if somebody, a female particularly, oh, She's very strong, like the handle of an ax, right? Like she may be wiry and thin, but she's not weak or fragile. She's strong. And in fact, in the, in the indigenous culture, one of the things that the elders would say about all the images of American models and things like that is they would say to me, why do the people in your culture want to stay um, girls? Meaning like pubescent that that's the ideal, what's wrong with you up there? <laughs> Which I find fascinating because when you start to, when you really, when you're not in this and you, I mean, we know this as women, but you really look at this, that image of the pubescent, you know, <clears throat> culture, nubile, right? And then we have the other with um, an elder once said to me, why would somebody, down in, in Guate, there's these, uh, anybody that's traveled in Central America or Latin America knows these little plastic like mini soccer balls and they're usually white with like red or black stripes or green and they're about this big right and the kids play with them because they're like one quetzal which is like 10 cents so you, all the kids can afford them right and they, they play soccer in the streets so <clears throat> the elders when when cable came in to my town and so forth and there were things like you know the models and the fake boobs right and again, no judgment, but they would say, who thought it was a good idea for the kids to take the soccer balls and the women to put them in? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I share that only in the ideas that we live with, and we as women know this in the Western culture, this is not a you know, newsflash, but is um, the images and the ideas around femininity and womanhood and empowerment and what's good and what's healthy and what's not are are really different really different and to me really really see that when you look at what it is to adorn yourself and again you don't have to have hand woven things there is i'll say something incredibly wonderful about wearing things that are hand woven you also find you have a lot less and they're very expensive based on you know uh other things because this this takes six months to make this so you, you will have, I have wipi, that's what this called, and corte, which are the skirts that are 12, 15 years old. Now, they graduate, those become my, you know, household daily, it's like your sweatpants, your worn out jeans, right? They graduate, 
some of them became couch cushion covers to cut them up. <laughs> but what it is, is that there are life cycles in your clothes or in your adornments, really what it is, versus disposable. Or versus, and yes, when we're adorning and designing, because we hand design these, they're unique to us. Um, it's an expression of you, but it's also then, um, there's a joyfulness that you wear it with versus, and I notice this like when I come back, um, and I do wear and have Western clothes, but is uh, the body consciousness in a non-healthy way that hits you the minute you're back in this culture is profound. It's amazing how different it is. Amazing how different it is. So one of the things that the elders teach us is that you weave yourself into being, including your physical form. And we say your donghas, your chubby around your belly. <laughs> Women at a certain age are supposed to have that. It's part of you earned it, they say. And it's like your body is being woven into its being. And so sometimes it expands and it contracts like the breath. But that the happiness is finding where it is that you feel happy and you feel strong and you feel vibrant. And by vibrant, what they mean is that your body carries your soul in such a way that the shininess of you is seen by others is how it's talked about. And so that has nothing to do with size, image, nothing. Mm -hmm. So that was a very long one, but what was, where does that sit with all of you? Uh, well, I mean, I'm just gonna, cause as you were, this morning, uh, interestingly, I woke up and I, um, cause I've been doing a lot of work on feminine energy with some of the women. And, and so mm. I really decided to do my own practice even more so, especially this morning, cause I knew we would talk to you and I, and I've been so much in my masculine. I said tomorrow, this morning is going to be about the feminine and just nurturing that. So I, I just listened to my body in bed and moved to just kind of, you know, Oh, let me just move in bed, lay here and, and notice what's going on. And then I said, Oh, it's telling me to stay in a flowery robe. And just like, it was just interesting. The, the thoughts of self-care this morning of slow, mm -hmm. of putting some music on of, of like, it was actually more conscious, even though I kind of do that, it was like a, a message more than just, I'm going to do this. Like, it, cause I took the time to kind of squirm in bed and, and just kind of be with my body. So I never wear this. I've been on all these, I, I, to today, I was like, I, I love it. This. <laughs> so I did, and I have these sleeves, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna make my tea, and then my coffee, and then whatever, and just, you know, so, and noticing then just taking the time to be that was self-soothing in that yeah. way. And this whole being born, uh, I thought that was huge when you said that, mm -hmm. you know, when you, that's the feminine, like really at the, the gift that we have is that we do create, we are life-giving and it's life-giving of a project. It's life-giving of our, of our adornment. It's life-giving of clothes. So when you start to say the clothes even more so, like mm -hmm. it's kind of just hitting home the depth of the life-giving of our physical body actually has that the masculine or the man can never really attach to profoundly as we can. Not in the same way. Mm -mm. No, not in the same way. Right. Mm -mm. That's all I'm sort of processing. That's beautiful. I have a totally weird th thing. As you're talking about the grandparent and then the, the parent is a vessel, like that bridge. I don't know if you can see behind me this picture. Can yeah. you see this right here? Uh huh. This, this is a pencil drawing of my grandpa in his traditional Czech clothing. Ah. Um, and my family grew up. I can walk you over there. Yeah, I want to see. I just got shivers in me. Yeah. Um, because my my family, I grew up in Iowa, and we have a, um, I don't know if you can see it very well. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. That's beautiful. Um, and we, I grew up in a, um, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and we have, um, this is my set piece for my commercial back here. Um, we... <laughs> In my town, there's something called Czech Village, and it's the largest settlement of Czech people outside of the Czech Republic besides <laughs> Nebraska, uh, Omaha. And my family was super active 
um, in the Czech Heritage, my grandpa, that one in the picture, um, and grandmother and my dad were on the committee that built the Czech Museum, which is the largest mm -hmm. Czech and Slovak museum outside of the Czech Republic. And I, my sister and I were both Czech princess, like win a scholarship pageant, get a costume, wave in parades, go to schools and talk about culture. Like, but I was so connected growing up to my grandparents um, that I don't know that I would think my parents were a vessel, like, but, and I skipped the generation, but I was very, very connected to them. And they, the way that they were a family and the way that they conducted life and our culture that I was lucky enough as a, this age human to be able to do that because not a lot of cultures still get that or kids get that mm -hmm. anymore that aren't of Latin American descent. Honestly, I think no, right. not a lot of people have that grew up in their town. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, learning and traditioning and I would, we would wear the croy, which is the traditional costume. And mm -hmm. you have this headpiece if you're married and the bonnet if you don't, and you have the colors of your, your and the, mm -hmm. the flowers that were printed and which sash you have and which embroidery. and I remember um, finding that so profoundly prideful to me as this like random teenage girl who everybody else was worried about all these other weird things. But I was constantly with all these old people um, doing the polka on a Sunday night with all these old Czech men, like whatever, you know, <laughs> but my, my youth and my family was very centric on that. And I really, I think that's why I, I love and and love my Arthur Murray community in the sense that it's very cultured, like we're very woven. It's a very different version of woven, let's be very honest. But um, I love that, like, um, when you talked about that and you did that, I was like, oh my gosh. And I was, I was like, look at, he's in the background. So I thought, I just feel like it's so important that we forget, like, not where you come from, but when you were talking about the rocking and the giving birth and the, like, you're adorned. Mm -hmm. um, I feel really lucky that I got to be adorned like that in my culture. And I'm only 50% Czech and it's not my entire culture, but it was celebrated and presented to me in a beautiful way. Um, and I'd, I've always had that, I've had that hanging in every place I've lived since I graduated from college. And it's a random like piece of art for most people probably, but I love it, you mm -hmm. know? So I don't mm -hmm. know, I was really taken by that, like, string of woven and and culture and i love that i loved it i think that's yeah. what i love about going to visit leanne in um in uh, santiago is that the culture it's such a community and everybody helps everybody else and um i just finished reading that book called together by um vivek um that Brene um, interviewed, that no. we all listened to that, right? Oh, yeah. And th that's what he was talking about, was that community um, that's missing from most of our cultures in North America, or at least the US and Canada right now, right? Those cultures, and, and in some ways we're critical of the immigrants. I know I hear this here, we're critical of the immigrants who come to Canada and yet they stay with their own people, right? And and stay in their own cultures, but that's their community, right? And that's so important for people because they feel um, they feel like they belong to something, and um, it's something greater than um, the individual. So I, I think very that's really spiritual. On a, it's very spiritual as, as opposed to religious. Mm -hmm. It's very yeah. spiritual. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, of course. And so that's, that's one of the things that I really love about where Leanne lives. Um, that is the culture, for sure. Yeah, and Amy, one thing I just, um, with that whole process that way, just a little other nugget on that, it's called e which means the seated replacement. And again, it's really interesting. Um, so when we say that the parents are the conduit or the vessel, it means it's like a gifting and an honoring that the soul or the part of the nature of who we are gets poured through them and out, right? So it's kind of like, um, again, that corn stalk. So from one seed comes many, right? Ears of corn. And then what happens is 
uh, by seasons of corn and in, within families. Like, so when corn is planted in it and we're, we're blessed that it grows, what any, what any good farmer or, or caretaker tender of that does is says, okay, part of this we eat, part we set aside, and part we hold and pass on, right? There's like a relationship with the corn to ensure that then the next planted seeds will provide fruit again, because that's really what cares for not only the grandparents and the parents to give the children, but the entirety of the family and the community. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So they are a vessel that gets passed on, but that's a gifting, like, because, um, how do you say in English? By experience and, and by, by time, our, our grandparents are wiser, <laughs> right? They just are, because they've had that. Elders are a huge part of every old culture, everyone. So their wisdom, then, their children get to be the the givers of life in that so life to them life to them to you and then it loops right almost like this right it loops and so they are the vessel but it's like um the other way it's talked about which is synonymous uh, is it's a garden and so typically the grandchildren learn from the grandparents the wisdoms of the gardening the parents take care of their daily needs. It's very much like it is in any culture, right? There's a different relationship there. And we have to remember that historically, um, families lived communally. It's only in the modern era since industrialization that even here in the US and Canada and the westernized world that we didn't do that. So we've lost a lot of what that story embodies. Um, but it is, it's one of the greatest gifts. And I think it's one of the the great sadness is that, I mean, it still does exist some, but that in the Western culture and the modern world now, we have very little of that grandchild uh, to pass on and it gets, it gets lost what, uh, in a matter of a generation or two, it gets lost mm -hmm. that fast. After hundreds, you know, centuries, thousands of years, and we lose it. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the griefs that our world has because it's such a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I feel like now, while my, in you saying that, like I should take more time to talk to my parents, <laughs> you know, and, and, and say, okay, talk to me about some of the <laughs> traditions yeah. you had. Mm -hmm. That. Um, so it's an interesting thing and it's, um, I think that's always a great thing. Um, I, I did some with my, my grandparents, um, but I think most of us wish we would have done more. But one of the things that happens in our world, and I don't really actually have an answer to this other than what the elders have shared with me, is that things like the breaking of family, the breaking of community. I mean, the reality is in the Western world is we're incredibly individuated, right? And we're incredibly driven towards the outer and the outer drives us. And I say this with all respect is we have our meditation practices. We do these things. We go out in nature, but it's a tune up, not a way of living, right? Mm -hmm. Historically with humanity, that is a way of life. Our relationship with ritual, with ceremony, with a, the earth, with that which feeds and nourishes us. And as modernization, industrialization took hold, we moved farther and farther as humanity away from that connection and the connection with our community because the more prosperity we have, the less interdependence there is with our neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. We go buy what we want, we go do what we want. We don't have to have an interdependency. And I'm sure for many of us, even as kids, the neighbors watched you. If you were out of something, you went to the neighbors to get it, right? I mean, we had a garden and we had extra beans. We took them to the neighbors. We were getting the apples off the green apple tree. And we knew instinctively who those extras went to. You just mm -hmm. took them and gifted them. And our neighbors did the same thing. Do any of you live in a place where that happens today? Do you, Jennifer? Yeah. Cool. Tell us about it. Uh, well, my neighbor has a, a garden that she shares, and uh, we we share a, a lawnmower between um, 
three houses. So, um, and we're all, I don't know, we, we just all always connect with each other if I need to borrow something. So we're definitely uh, closer knit that way, you know, where some, you know, in reference to say, maybe not knowing your neighbors or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So they're usually my first go-to when if I'm uh, needing something or looking for something. So where, you know, it's like my neighbor across the street, her sharing her veggies and stuff like that. And I'm doing a garden similar to hers this year. So hopefully I'll be able to do the same thing and share the veggies. How did you all create that? Um, it was organic. Mm -hmm. And out of need and necessity, like the lawnmower. And maybe we're all cheap. I think, too. <laughs> but it was, yeah, we're all cheaper. Like, well, why should we have all, all go out and each buy a lawnmower? Like the neighbor was getting rid of hers. So we thought, well, the three of us will just adopt it and, and share it and use it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's she's always totally, asking. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Like it totally yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like why does everybody need to have a lawnmower? Yeah, like everybody example. doesn't use it at the sa same time, <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, I think that's great. That's like a community lawnmower. We should do more stuff like that. Yeah. And I think it's, it's that the, the, that street specifically, because I go see her every weekend. It's, it's the, it's like the middle, it's your typical middle class, right? Like, can, can you feel, cause there's kids. There's, so there's some people that it's not that, but when the people have a lot of money and they then they tend to isolate more they just make a bigger house to yeah. be more secluded compared to that middle ground that's the feeling the kids are in the streets still like kids play in the streets there now i don't know if it's just because of covid but there's always kids playing on your street jen like all the time well usually in suburbia every single neighborhood there's kids not every the street. single let me just say you well maybe i don't know but I notice your street, as soon as I drive up, from the moment I get on your street, all the way to the top, it's watch out for the kids. Yeah. It's I rarely have that It's a cultural feeling. thing, too. What's that? It's a cultural thing, too. Sure. Yeah. 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 So just things like that to, to like, it's, there's something about there's the kids are always outside, the houses are nice, but not over, I mean, just on your street, there's no big, big, huge houses. But right the next street over, there are. <laughs> right, I find it interesting that your street specifically has all that medium size, people have porches, they're outside, like, you know, it's just interesting to go up that street and notice that, that, I mean, there's the odd house that there is nobody outside, but most of them have outside kids, you know, there's that kind of feeling uh, that you won't get in other streets, perhaps. And Jennifer, where do you live? Sorry, because this is my first time meeting you. Where are you? Uh, in, um, on the outskirts of Montreal. Okay. That's exciting that you have that. That's neat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Where I used to live before was even like a hundred times more than this. Really? Yeah. Like we were in a horse shaped community and I used to call it Sesame street and everybody <laughs> knew one another and, you know, we could leave the house and leave our kid out there. And there was 18 kids who played with each other every single day, morning, noon, and night. We all were on, we had a big email list of everyone. We'd have street parties. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it, was an, it really was. I picked the neighborhood just so my daughter would grow up there. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I felt know this um, it's really important. Yeah, really. There, there are certain pockets of places like Black Rock, Connecticut there. There was like, the, like all of everything you're saying, like the same thing. It's like everybody's outside. They all cater at the, the one marketplace they gather. So, and everybody watches like, so it's, but they're pockets. They're like pockets of that. They're not everywhere. You're right. But like in, in Santiago, I mean, in the evening, everybody gathers in the square there. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was thinking about uh, the last time we were there, we walked down and we were watching the women um, do their, their laundry in the lake. And they were, you know, they were together and I don't know if they all go at the same time, you know, or, you know, what that is, but it's, it's just that people really do, it seems like people do more things together. It's communal. Yeah. Yeah. It's very communal. Yeah. It's well, lovely. We have farmers also. markets. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find there are people can, like I go to the farmer's market, uh, not too far from here. It's always the same people. 
you know, and there's communal tables where you could buy coffee or croissant or whatever, and you sit there and, you know, you just start talking to the people who are there, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I find, um, yeah, there's a lot of that that's happening, a lot of grassroots things. So you've sought that out though, right? I mean, meaning you've moved to communities where that's already existed, or I'm just curious. No, there's, I mean, where I live on the West Island, I mean, it's, you know what it is? It's, it, I think it's because of hockey. Mm. I think that is um, a big thing, but even growing up, I mean, growing up, we were always on the streets playing. And I think like video games and stuff like that are, the kids are staying in more where we, we would be out playing. I mean, we'd be kicked mm. out and we'd come in yeah. when uh, the street lights went on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so everybody's playing. There's a lot of the boys now, even girls, like they're all playing hockey. So, and I see that in a lot of streets. It's rare to find a street that does not have that in the air, like the West Island where I'm at. But like I said, there, it's a cultural thing too. There's, there's like um, some cultures that it's not part of their upbringing where they come from, right? Mm -hmm. So they come here and they're the ones you don't really see it much. But for us, like um, Catholics and waspy people, you know, <laughs> that's how we grew up, right? You know, I'm talking, you know, say third generation uh, Canadian mm -hmm. and all across Canada, all across Canada. I've been to many cities living in a lot of different cities and it's all the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do others so, have that? Oh, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, no, I was just curious because I think that's, I think that's really lovely and, um, and inspiring that it's still there because, um, like where I grew up, you don't see it anymore. You see it in little tiny pockets, little tiny pockets, but as the norm, eh, not much, not much. Yeah. Well, I think also too, there's been, um, uh, especially with what's happening now, this new change of, you know, eat dirt is good for the kids, building their immune system, you know, playing, um, getting off, like we're realizing the electronics aren't healthy anymore, you know, like it was all great at the beginning, but now, you know, there's, I think there's, a, we're going to start seeing more grassroots things, you know, uh, even the schools, you look at the schools, they're doing more vegetable gardens, they have more, um, they have uh, green roots um, clubs and there's all kinds of new things, um, you know, for education. And I think that it's a big lifestyle shift that's starting to happen. That's cool. Yeah. Hoping anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, the, you know, it was interesting in this book, there was talking about a lot of, a lot of that same thing and, and what, um, they were talking about the things that people were doing to uh, have community, more community and to um, mm -hmm. get the kids in school to be, um, you know, cause there's been such issues with bullying, bullying and things like that is to get the kids more compassionate and empathetic. And they have all these different programs that they're introducing in the schools, which I think are, I think it's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that kind of stuff is really, is really good for sure so yeah so leanne just to, um not to switch gears and if anybody wants to keep talking about this but i i i know that we've talked a little bit about the about the maya perspective of the pandemic maybe you can share some of that with us and what what that perspective is mm -hmm. And so whenever I get asked to talk about this, I always want to share with people is I'm just giving you the, the pieces and parts that have been passed to me in oral tradition. You'll hear many others, right, about what this is about. And um, also that most of us heard something about the 2012 Mayan calendar, right, in some way during that time. And it was all fear-based and into the world. And shortcut, spoiler, that was fear-based Western bullshit. It's not true. Um, so we kind of have to go back to that in order to talk about what this is about. So, um, and again, it's that. So I just wanted to share that, like typically if somebody were to tell a story about this, the stories are epic and multifaceted. That's why you see me stopping. So a story like this would typically, you would sit for six to eight hours to talk 
about which part of the story here and that one over there and someone else would add this and then it would come back and it would be that way. So um, I'm giving you a really, really tiny synopsis. But um, so what happened in, in the ancient Maya, I meaning, you know, you see the pyramid and so forth and, the, and in the Mayan traditions, in most areas, we're talking at least 3000 years of lineage, if not more. So that's a big, span in humanity in terms of culture and traditions being carried unbroken. So yet today, when you look at this, for instance, you will find these same symbols on those pyramids from classic Maya and before, which is 600 modern era and back to before modern era. So the importance of that is saying that when the Mayan traditions speak of prophecy, they're talking about lineage. And in the word prophecy itself is a little tricky because it doesn't actually translate very well based on cultural inflection. Prophecy, the best way to explain prophecy, I mean those oral traditions of when people were told this was how it's going to unfold or these are the things to be aware of, is really more about advisements right? And prophecies aren't there in the context like a lot of things are portrayed in terms of like uh, into the world, run and hide, stockpile all your stuff so you're okay. There's none of that in the oral traditions in that way. That's fear-based, right? And that's self-individuated, not about the collective and Mother Earth. That's about a person being afraid and grabbing your own stuff. Um, and the other is to say that when we're advised that certain things are going to come and play out this way, it is an offering, almost like a ritual. It's an offering us to say, here, this is what we can give you. Do with it what you can or what you will in the best way for you, right? In the best way of humanity. So when you say prophecy, that's really kind of how it lives. It's an offering and a wisdom from the elders that spans centuries. So when we talk about oral tradition in, in the Maya, and this, by the way, is not just the Maya. This, these stories of this time exist in pretty much every indigenous culture of the entire Americas, right? In fact, um, the story keepers or carriers, as they're called, um, started meeting, this true story, in 1963 in Peru because they had been the keepers of these stories and the ancestors had advised them that this time, this modern era time would come and that they needed to care for the stories until the time came when they would join with others to begin to share them. And in many traditions, again, these are talked about as the seeds and oftentimes actually the story keepers are also the keepers of the original seeds. There are banks of original seeds of squash and corn and vegetables and herbs that native traditions have kept hidden and guarded. They're seed keepers and story keepers, right? So in 1963, when they got together, uh, and this is important to the Mayan aspect too, is that they knew the time had come for them to start to join. Now imagine 1963, mountains of Peru, no telephones, internet, anything. And if I'm not wrong, I'm lousy with numbers. I think there were 23 or 26 story keepers who came from all over the Americas, call it Turtle Island, North and South. And they began to gather there to tell the stories. And again, fast forward, what they discovered was that while the intonations, the characters, because of geography and so forth, uh, of what the stories they were keepers of, uh, differed the heart of what they were told to carry was the same and this is from South America up to the far tips of Alaska North America so when you see for instance uh, the United Nation Council of the Indigenous that's that's part of this when you saw and if anybody watched the Dakota Access Pipeline the protests and the coming together the grandmothers there who led that that's part of this. Those are part of the stories of advisement we were given. Now, in my community, the, the heart of what was shared with us is based on, a, on the Mayan calendar. The Mayan calendar goes in like just under 500 year cycles. It's called a katun. And a katun is that cycle of 
of time. So one way we make sense of this again is to go back. So right before the conquest and the Spanish came and all the disease and so forth, the wise ones, which we call Nahuals, then the wise leaders, those would be your scientists, astronomers, shamans, healers, all your, your council folks that cared for and, and led the community said, we are entering a katum, a cycle of great suffering, not just for ourselves, but for people uh, like us all over the world. It's a test. It's a challenge. It's going to be a time of darkness. Okay. Well, Spanish came, suffering, smallpox, genocide, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm saying this again in a very, very short version of what they said would happen. And this, by the way, is written in stelae, meaning stone monuments. So this is oral tradition. It's also in in those, those sacred monuments. So that last cartoon brings us to 2012. In, in 2012, in the Mayan ways, the calendar ends. And that's why you had all that fear stuff of end of the world. And that's not actually what it was about. It was saying after this time of suffering, the world will be in such a place of imbalance that th that humanity itself will have to decide whether it is going to remember the sacred as central to life or to destroy itself. That's why it wasn't written forward because so much of it is dependent on humanity choosing how it will be written, how it will be carried, what stories, what planting they will or won't do, right? And we were told, many are aware of this one, that it's like in a lot of Native American uh, tradition, decisions are only made based on the seven previous generations, their wisdoms, and the impact it will have on the seven generations to come. Right? And for in the Mayan tradition in Mayan town, that's very much like the weaving, right? So you don't just put one thread down without an awareness of what it's creating, right? Because, or you don't plant a seed without tending to it, blessing it, knowing what you're going to grow, because otherwise, it's a seed, right? So what it was saying, and what it is saying, is that during this time, that 2012 just marked a calendar date, uh, there was nothing, say this, calendar dates mark a ritual day because in the indigenous way, time is infolded and unfolded. It's not a day, it's like a hologram, right? Of what we do, what we create, what we offer, what we take, et cetera, our relationship with it. So last part of this is that <clears throat> we were also advised and told that during this time, meaning it's an, an era, like our lifetimes, right? During this time, that we would have caused so much harm to Mother Earth that it's like you, your mother um, is on the ground and you're sprinkling grains of sand or prickly things in her eye. And because she's a mother, she'll blink it out or the rains will wash it out. But eventually you sprinkle and you agitate and you hurt her too much and she'll scratch, right? She's gonna react because she has to. Uh, so as we were taught is we're at a time where mother earth has to scratch she has to yank and when you um uh, you can look it up online too santiago atitlan well in lake atitlan it's a huge caldera lake it's really beautiful over a million years old that's surrounded by by three volcanoes and mountains and so forth it's the sierra nevadas the same ones that run all the way through colorado mexico on down um but is, it literally is an image of the great mother laying on her back. So the lake would be her womb and her navel and her knees are up and her boobies are up and her arms are up, right? So she's reclined on the earth. So for, in many places, that is, mother earth is mother. It's not a concept that she just provides us food. She's our mother. And those volcanoes are both her breasts or her knees, depending on which volcanoes you're talking about, and their grandmother and grandfather, the nourishment, the wisdom that watches over us, right? Now, the reason I share that is because uh, whenever you take oral tradition and you bring it into the modern world or people write it, you flatten it, which I'm not saying is good or bad. I'm saying it's not the same, right? So I just want to share that what we're saying about Mother Earth, the mother being alive and her scratching 
it is understood as being the same as if if you're poking your mom or poking somebody and poking and poking and poking, what eventually happens usually, <laughs> right? Most of the time you remain calm. Most of the time you're able to pass it through, but there are occasions where it's just too much, right? And then what happens? Snatch or swipe or walk away. So there's a literal um, living relationship in this. It's not punitive, it's saying the world is this out of balance, that the mother has to react and respond. So we, same thing are, as her seat of replacements, as well as all humanity, are faced with deciding what we will plant and what we will create moving forward. And it's up to us. Because we've forgotten that it's the seven generations before and the seven after us. We've forgotten, they tell us, you forgot your sacred seeded ways, that what you are seeded and gifted is what you seed and gift and to teach the children you forgot. So when we say out of balance, a lot of what the elders advise us is in what ways and how can you help the remembering and create ways of community and kindness and care um, moving forward because, um, uh, how do you say that in English? This is my last piece on this is that because they also said this is a time where we'd be really thirsty, like people would be very parched. Um, it's called the dry, dusty, dirt bone roads. Like people would in many ways feel dry and thirsty for community, for love, for compassion, for play, for nourishment. And so to humanity, to us as, as their seated ones is to say, how do we create that? What are the ways for ourselves and others to invite that back? I just want to, because I know we got dancers in here. One of the things, and in the old traditions and always, is things like dancing and gardens and um, sports, um, because they create community and they invite our children and it creates a council around them, right? And it creates ways they plant. Um, it, groups who tell stories, like whether that's cultural or elders, um, they also said that one of the great breakings we would have is that our grandchildren would no longer know their grandparents. They would not live close enough to one another to do that thing we were talking about, right? Uh, so the, the rejoining of elders with our kids is such a vital seeding soul thing, right? How do we do that? What, how do we create that in a modern world that we don't live communally? And I'm just throwing those out there is to say the prophecies weren't about this being in the end. They're about uh, a calling and an invitation to say, what do we choose to do with this? In what ways can we begin to remember the sacred, to remember our kindness, our care, compassion, community? Sacred isn't, isn't germane to a religion or a tradition. It's, it's not. It's about being aware of more than ourselves. And my last piece in this is, we were told the world will become um, so afraid that people will hide in their homes. People will hide away with the windows and the doors locked. The way the elders would say it is, so they can't hear the birds and the wind can't blow. They'll hide in their homes in such a way that not even the dust messes the floor. They'll hide in their homes in such a way that they'll forget the day and the night and the seasons because they'll be so afraid. So, for me, and I can only speak for me and for others that I know I've talked to is, this is one of those, of the hiding in the homes, this, this pandemic. So some people ask, did they say this specific pandemic? No, it's, it, it doesn't work that way. It's that these, this would, these things would come because of the imbalance we had created. And so for, for those who were taught in this way is, um, not blindly, but it's a knowing of, yeah, this pandemic is one, is part of this. It's part of the calling of what we'll choose to create. And do you, Leanne, feel like you see hope that people are noticing that? 
that there's an imbalance that, I mean, besides the people in this, I mean, most, some people are like, at, but yeah. like globally, like not globally, I'm not sure how to, how to even ask that question, but if you. I do have a lot of, I do, I do have hope. I absolutely have hope. And, and what I often say to people is that maybe for my own sanity preservation as well as my humanity. I mean, um, and it may, but no, I do have hope. And one other piece that I failed, that I didn't mention there is that in all of these prophecies too, what is also told is that during this time, those who can guide and lead the change and the healing are women. Part of the shift is from the masculine to the feminine, and it's not in rejection of the masculine, but it's saying because we give birth and we know how to do this stuff that Patty was talking about, that our, the women stepping into leadership, because this is a death and rebirth. I mean, the death is happening right it doesn't matter what's in your backyard or my backyard it's dying like this is way out of balance and i don't say that in a political way this is not sustainable it's what what we have right now it's it's just not science life i mean those are factual things i'm saying in that way so the calling of saying it, it may his soul rest in peace. I was with a, a gentleman who was like a head storyteller and shaman, and he knew and understood, for instance, that the women needed to be supported. Now, here's what I like about this. He would not say that the women need empowered because that's wrong. The women needed to be supported so that their power could be embraced by people and by themselves which i find really beautiful right mm -hmm. so because that's a really different relationship as a woman instead of saying i need to be empowered no i am to support that within myself and others is really what it's about and that um and I, I'm always very conscientious about this because in the Western world, the way we talk about masculine and feminine tends to be uh, much more of a polarity and it tends to be kind of culturally charged. What we're talking about is in the feminine is the ability to give birth, the ability to regenerate life. That is a feminine aspect. Men have it too. Some not so much, some quite a lot. Like we don't want to get too divisive in this. Um, and, um, that the women must be cared for and supported in standing in the rebirthing process because it's grandmother moon, the great whole full moon from the night sky, which is like the womb, the void of darkness who shines light to give birth. She's actually the, the grandmother of weaving, grandmother moon. So it's the feminine also that is called to to remember how, we say to remember how to weave, <laughs> to remember how to give birth. That doesn't matter whether you give birth to a, a child or not, it has nothing to do with it. How to give birth and how to support others like midwives. Um, and actually I was talking to Lindsay, so you know, you keep bringing up the midwife. And, and I'll, I'll stop because I want to hear from all of you. You can tell this is my love is that what, what the partner of the midwife is, the birther is the destroyer. Right. And so we have all this destruction happening in our world. And this is myth mythic, sacred throughout time, traditions all over the place. So when you have the great midwife, who's the giver, the, the, the caretaker, the guider of birth, the destroyer has to be in balance with that. Because any time there is a seed planted, right, it explodes in order to become what it's, it's going to grow to be. It's violent. When a star is formed, boom, sperm and egg, boom. If you magnify that, it's like a cataclysmic sci-fi film, right? So when we talk about the destroyer, we're not talking about harm. We're talking about the commission of the destruction or the sacrifice. That's why that's in every faith and religion and tradition throughout the world of commissioning a sacrifice for the rebirth, right? Uh, when I first started this journey to... I studied quantum physics because my brain needed a way to relate the spiritual, so to speak, things with the tangible, and I needed to kind of bridge my worlds. So in quantum physics, we know that there, there's a, a, essentially a finite 
amount of energy, right? And it's never really born or destroyed. It's simply regenerated into new things, right? So like my being has a certain amount of energy for this lifetime and it's in a constant process of, of shedding and being utilized and regenerating and grow. Like this, our organisms are alive, right? It's a constant process of creation that we hold. Now as women, we hold that in a particularly powerful way. It's a gifting we have. And in the prophecies, not just in the mind, but throughout is also the aspect that knows and knew and advised that the women, the feminine would be the heart and the vitality of this because, um, I'm gonna say this a little tongue in cheek, you can't get a bunch of guys in to take mother earth and all her sacred naked holiness and heal her because that's not their job right we're not asking them to procreate we're <laughs> we're not asking they can't nurture and nourish something that they don't embody in the way that we can so it's different mm -hmm. so again that's why it falls to women and the certain sacredness that we know to partner with the men and the masculine it's not a rejection because that's actually what has been part of the destruction right is domination and separation and that's not good so we have to be very conscious of that is to partner with that and lead, create, help, help ourselves and help the world remember what it is to rebirth and regenerate. Because that's, we, that's what we're called to discover how to do. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, when you said all that in your story about the, 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 the sand dropping and then she scratches, I was listening to another interview of a gentleman that I, I need you to see if I can hook you guys up. Uh, Satyan is his name and he's in Vancouver, Canadian. Mm. Has a lot of, uh, been having a lot of great speakers on all of this different types of topics and a lot of shaman too. And he, at one point he, uh, and one guy, he, one guy talked about building this community where, <laughs> to your point, to all of our, where you don't just come in and feel something and leave, that we're actually gonna create a community where people wanna come to to live and, and experience the, the well-being of community of those like-minded people. So as a masculine to say, we need to become responsible to create and build this instead of just do one day retreat and walk away. It's actually not enough. So he kind of made reference to that. And then he talked about how he said a woman Someone, and I don't remember who it was, but he said a woman had told the same description. He goes, you know, gentlemen, I'm tired of you guys um, treating me like your mother because your mother will love you no matter what. Treat me like your wife because she will not accept the bullshit that you guys do. To a degree, I'm paraphrasing. Uh -huh. So it, it was interesting because he had said, stop treating me like your mother because your mother will love you unconditionally. And it's not working because you guys are not stepping up to the plate. Treat me like your wife, because mm -hmm. she only wants honor and to be, you know, it's so uh, just to add, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. just to add to what you were saying. Very the same. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been feeling intuitively exactly what you've said. Um, and I've been seeing the uh, growth of it. I think I became, well, I know I became conscious about it um, 28 years ago about um, the planet and the environment. And I've been a bit of a freak. Uh, I've had a freak on about it since in a good, healthy way. And um, especially with the device of social media, we, well, I've been able to watch it happening more and more. Women's groups, um, people voicing more of their opinions. And I'm noticing uh, a huge shift taking place, especially in the last 10 years, um, you know, um, you know, videos happening about, you know, bare feet on the earth, uh, you know, the trees taught their, their roots talking with each other underneath, um, the word shaman, we're hearing more and more people are taking courses, people know it's healthy to get out in nature. I mean, that's, I, that's just like tiny, tiny, tiny bit. But I, I, I see it more and more. And this is such a, huge huge opportunity we're at this great divide right now mm -hmm. and we're at each end like um nobody's nobody's in the middle 
or at one end or the other end. And it's the yin and yang, the fear and the love. And this is where we are. This is where we're sitting. Every system that we have in place, their own ecosystem is, is, is at that. The, the, our government, our healthcare system, our planet, our, our everything, we're facing this polar opposites. And it's the big decision, which side, are, where are you going to sit? Mm -hmm. And so I've taken it upon myself um, quite seriously these days to, to sit in higher vibration and to not fear, and I don't feel fear in any way, shape or form, zero about this whole uh, virus thing. I'm trying to uh, be compassionate, empathetic, but I really honestly uh, feel that we we are living this as our karmic um, obligation um, and to find balance. You know, for all here for as uh, one soul or individual souls, uh, we're always trying to find balance and um, and you know the planet is a soul, our government has a soul, the animals have soul, we have souls, our communities have souls, and we're always collectively trying to find that balance and trying, and it's through love, and keeping our vibration high and sitting in that seat. And that's our big decision, is where are you going to sit? And, how, and, and there's opportunities now. I mean, people are doing Zoom things, you know, like look at us now. How beautiful is this? I honor you coming here. I think this is spectacular. I, I think this is, it's, I, I, I'm very touched that you're uh, giving us your time. Mm -hmm. And I, I see it more and more and more. And uh, I personally have a lot of hope. Uh, I, I, I feel it, you know, and uh, it, it, and maybe a lot of us are going to perish and so be it. But in the end, that's not the important thing. To me, mm -hmm. the important thing is the planet and Mother Earth, because, you know, we're just here for a limited amount of time. Our spirit's going to come, go, come, go, come, go. I mean, it, that's what I believe. And, and so we just have to um, keep on keeping ourselves in balance and bringing ourselves at a higher level. That's, 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 that's how I see it. Yeah, yeah even, uh, oh, I'm sorry to talk. But no, go ahead, buddy. I was, um, the other thing I started doing was this thing called medicine movement and um, part of the whole thing, because it's based on a lot of indi indi in indigenous. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this morning I was looking at their, their sort of Mandela so that when you dance and you move, you're inspired by the Mandela, which is the earth, which is who we are and, and what we've accepted to fire, which is our expression, to water, which is allow us to purify and cleanse, to air, to look at our calling, to go back into the ether of, of the uh, phoenix, which is the transformation. So that your movement and your intention goes through the flow of that, so that there's a, a, an internal healing process uh, that we all uh, have to some degree that you can allow your imagination and your body to go through that. So I thought, because uh, I've been doing that every week and, and this specifically geared on the actual healing, which as you're sharing this is just an extra added, uh, you know, again, this, this sort of merging of all these mindset and cultures and how, and there too, they talked about community and here we are as a community, all of us every Sunday going through this communal Zoom transformation of our of our essences of our souls through the this process of the mandela and the healing and using the earth elements and, and through movement so um yeah it's been interesting i find leaders and tools are popping up more and more and more because the witches back then not even that long ago were all being burnt and i mean you know <laughs> verbally uh, shamed and burnt and not accepted and now they're revered and welcomed and honored in general you know it's a great time it's a I find this we are in an incredibly special time yeah I would agree um, one thing I just want to offer that's an interesting piece um, uh, of the work and the 
the things that we're all standing in and, and um, being part of in this regard is, is vital. And it's also interesting, one of the advisements that the elders said to us, and I, I'm looking down because it's hard to do this. I'm, I'm often translating from like Zutuki, which is a poetic, like each word means 10 things to Spanish to English. Um, so bear with me for a sec, is that they said to us, there will be, um, during this time, there will be a remembering of the old ways, that sacred we're talking about, right? So when you look at things like, we got yoga, we got all this stuff going on, da 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 and they said, it will be like little infant tiny seeds trying to remember again, because people will have forgotten so the word remembering literally is very interesting. It means to remember, not here, to remember, to re-put back together, right? To re-weave, to re-embody, to replant that. And one of the interesting parts of that process is that whether it's, and this is true of humanity across time and space, and I think will always exist, but it's one of the really fascinating parts of this is that practicing yoga by and large in the US is not the equivalent of what it was in its home country. Christianity brought from another land here out of its birthplace is not the same as its birth origin, mm -hmm. right? It's just not. It's an extenuation, it's a replanting, a reseeding, or adapting of it. And there's a reason why this is important. People then um, and I'm going to say this jokingly because I lived in Colorado and we have a village at the, the lake called San Marcos. And when I lived in Colorado, it was Boulder, Colorado. So just I, in this group, I'm being overly blunt. So you get a lot of people in that who feel a calling and they get really excited. And all of a sudden, everybody's a shaman. Everybody's a healer. Everybody's a this, right? It's because of that thirsty hungriness. And that's good, Right. But here's the trick, <laughs> as the elders taught us. So for instance, Wendy introduced me as a shaman. That's mm -hmm. not embarrassing for me, but I would never introduce myself that way, ever. Yeah, I know. I get, ever. I, I, I get that. Yeah. And I'm so, using the word loosely. Yeah, I know. But here's the interesting part. So what, what the, the vessel is- never, the, I don't mean to interrupt. Why would you never introduce yourself like that? What makes you say that? Well, because it's such a sacred thing and it's because mm -hmm. it's a funky little, uh, conundrum because if you were born and raised in the culture the people know who does what mm -hmm. right so like as an example if somebody from another town came and said um, so you wouldn't introduce yourself like I am this it's about that the pride right. the it's not it's something you live not something it's not a title it's something you live there are words for it mm -hmm. and you would only say that in certain like council circles Right. It looks like right now people are saying, well, I'm a leader. We should, you're not a leader if you have to say, tell people you are. They that's just, exactly <laughs> right. That's the exact <laughs> truth. Of that's it. Exactly. Right, Amy. And right now in our yeah. company, that is very clear. People with titles of leadership are not necessarily the ones leading. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, like, that you said yeah. that. I just, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I no. thought you said something that I would want to investigate. So that, thank you. No, absolutely. And so what it is, is that within a company, within a community, so like people come to, um, and this took me years, by the way, and I don't have it 100% figured out, but like when we do retreats, like Wendy was saying and so forth, or when I try to do my website, this is one of the weirdest conundrums I go through every time I've done it over 30 years, because it's like, ugh, I, I can describe what I do, but it's not innate. It's not it doesn't have titles and labels because the, the sacred context is, is that so if somebody came to our town, let's say I'm hanging out with my other friends for the sake of conversation that are also shamans and healers or have their own little gigs going, right? Meaning that's their work in the world. And somebody came from out of town and said, I'm looking for a shaman because this happens. And I'm talking other parts of Guatemala or Latin America in our town. And people just go, hmm, who's sick? Who's sick? What is their sickness? They won't say, oh, so-and-so and so and so and no, no, no. Who's sick? What imbalance do they have? How long have they had it? Hmm. And everybody waits and watches. And then it becomes most often like a collaboration of us saying, like a council would, 
I think maybe this or that or who and uh, and uh. So the care becomes a collective of that. No one stands up and goes, dude, I do, I do kidneys. <laughs> 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 or, you know, I do mental illness. We all know that. And so I share that in terms of I, exactly um, what Amy was saying is, and, and Jennifer too, is that we're in this time where to meet the world, we kind of have to have these titles. However, it's an interesting thing that the most sacred and the strongest leaders in this do not have titles. They don't. So I think that just for all of us as we're out there, and I'm saying this to myself too, and I, and I watch it in so many ways and, and amidst it um, and in our lives is that one of the things that I think in this change time is that we look for strength with humility, right? Who are those who, um, who walk who they are, who are indeed what we would define as leaders of honor, respect, et cetera. But I think it's really an important thing and it's a process of discovery because we, we do need the titles. I, I'm, but um, who are the humble ones who don't do it for the title, don't wave their banners, right? Who embody it, invite others and create it. And I believe that that's what the sacred feminine is it's one of its aspects that's so powerful actually because it's an invitation right and one of the things the elders always say to us you know if you prop somebody on a pedestal like saints or or a deity or something eventually the pedestal is going to break or they're going to fall that's a, that's not a safe place to put them we say you wouldn't put your grandmother perched on the top of a pointy rock you would want her down touching the earth because it's where she's safest right she's nourished that's up there is dangerous for her so i love that as a way of saying you know as we navigate this ourselves and others and i think that's kind of a tell as in pokers those who got their feet planted and are walking and that is not devoid of passion and vibrancy go get them like yeah scream it right whatever but those who don't have the humility what the elders taught us is to say they're infants, actually, because if they're really creating and um, doing what they're talking about, they wouldn't have time to talk and title themselves. They'd be too busy, right? And again, it's not a judgment, but they would say they still like a um, like baby birds. They're still chirping so loud because they need to be fed because they're still growing, right? So it's not wrong but it's the noticing of those nuances that I think really helps us unite each other and, and stay humble and, and strong in this, right? And I could go on about that one forever, but does that, that's one of the things they taught us. And I just think it's so important because it helps you discern very quickly. Not that you're gonna reject somebody, but it helps you discern very quickly where you're at and where others are at and what that partnership has and holds and maybe where it doesn't, you know, or a different perspective of what that holds. Very cool. That's so we, you know, go ahead, Patty. No, just it was a big one because for me too, and I still go through it, I'm in and out of it with this whole trying to be this public persona of something. And but a big resistance to even getting started was is is there too much ego attached to this? What what uh, all of that? Because part of it is self-promotion. So uh uh so there's um it's tricky. It is. <laughs> yeah. I can just share, and I, this is an ongoing process for me as well. I've been invited to be on TV shows and reality things and all kinds of stuff. And consistently I've chosen not, and I'm not waving a flag to say, oh, look at me humble over here. It's because I can't figure out how, how to balance it yet. I, and I, it hasn't gotten clear to me. Know how clear it will get, but what I do, what I have discovered over these years is that um, if your heart knows it's true, and we're just human, and by the way, ego is not evil, right? If it's if it's part of what gives you strength and bolsters you to help carry out something that needs to be carried, then give it a hug, right? Um, and I've talked to the elders about this too, is that is, as long as your heart knows it's true. One of the elders said to me once, 
if your heart is pounding and telling and talking to you, in our way, we would say the ancestors are in there beating the drum with you, the grandmothers and the grandfathers are touching and telling you to go, then you honor that and you go, right? And then you have to navigate the pieces in the process, but that's how they have taught us to discern. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So we have to honor our soul's purpose. Absolutely. We've come here for a good reason. And that heartbeat um, is speaking to you to push you into that, that direction. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I really believe we all have to honor ourselves and follow our heart or, you know, our soul's purpose and be authentic because, you know, we're given these gifts and what a shame it would be if we don't share gifts. We are meant to be here and share our gifts. And if it's about, you know, the promotion to, to get the word out there, to share your gifts, I mean, we're set up. I mean, we've set it all up a certain way to be able to do that. Right. You no, know, just, you know, as long as, like you're saying, coming from your heart and it feels right, you know, go with that. You know, and I, I agree 100% with the ego. It's, an, it's, it's there for a reason. I don't think we should be shaming it, putting it in the closet. It's got a purpose mm -hmm. and we have to use it right. You know, it, it, it has a very important part in our lives and it's not to be put in the closet, but it's to be watched as well. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it, we always have to, but that's, that's the, the consciousness of ourselves, watching ourselves, you know while yeah. we do things and not just doing it, you know, doing things deliberately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is the, the, I guess the penetration of that, of that masculine energy, right. To infuse the value that's necessary because you have to kind of stand on that belief and, and share it to some degree. Yeah. And you need that masculine energy sometimes to enact things and carry it out in the world. Cause it comes from within us, right. But you got to get it out there. And by the way, I'm just charging my computer. I have a battery issue. So I'm still very much with you and moving around. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I work with a lot of business people um, over the years, I've been blessed to work with everything from Coke execs to, to entrepreneurs, like, like a friend, Wendy and others and therapists and, personal growth folks, you name it, which is one of the fun things, one of the great blessings in my life. And I have created a book kind of in this regard um, is if, so for me, um, everything in life is a ritual or a ceremony, right? So if we, if we approach our work, our gifts, our passions, and how we promote those in the world and how we develop our businesses, business isn't evil right? It's not. Um, if how we promote those is a way of creating a ritual. Um, I've been blessed to be in thousands of ceremonies and rituals and um, has taught me so much that applies uh, to everyday life. So if you were, um, so like Patty, like you were saying, if you were to create a ritual or a ceremony, let's say around inviting people to explore something, a couple of key aspects of that. One, we said heart, passion. The other is invitation, right? If we look at things like a powwow or a big ceremony, yes, there are those enacting the process, initiating, collaborating to create that experience or to create that ritual, if you will. But the ritual only holds what it does based on the invitation and the experience, the counsel, the community of others, right? So I think that's a way, whether you're doing, I've also worked with comedians, whether you're doing humor, promotions, whatever, it's about the heart, the passion, and tricks or humor can be part of it. It should be. It's one of the most powerful medicines we own, right? Is playfulness okay? But it's the invitation and the embracing and the creating of a counsel together that then leads somewhere or creates an experience, creates an impact, creates or inspires an action, right? Then you're good to go. It's those pedestals that are the risky ones, right? And that's what people are really inclined to, is those pedestals. It's the invitation that really, really creates the ceremony and the ritual that is collaborative, it's collective. 
Oh my gosh. So much amazing information, Leanne. I know we can go on all day and maybe everybody wants to, I'm not (laughs) sure. (laughs) I'd like to, uh, Leanne, um, now I know Wendy, uh, I think when you said you've been there twice. Um, yeah. And so what happens? You show up, um, and is it a week, two weeks of what do you do? Ceremonies, you, you know, circles, talking, like what happens? All of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Usually every group's different, meaning I have groups that we organize and then people come or I'll get a group of people who ask to organize their own. So there's some deviation right. in, in uh, here we go, modern world. I do have a website that kind of lists things simply because it is a different world and culture. It's sort of, I, I over the years kind of created a menu of saying, here's options, but it is in essence a retreat in a sense, like you go to a yoga retreat, but we don't do yoga. We do ceremony and we get out in nature um, and have group times to meet. So how we structure that is aligned with the mind calendar. I have a crew of folks from Santiago that we've worked together for years. Our beloved Juan is our primary ritual shaman. Oh, we love Juan (laughs) so much. We love him. They're like family, right? Um, And so then again, depending on the group and their comfort level and the depth they want to go and what the focus is, essentially we customize everything. Where you stay, how many we have, the activities we do, because it can, you can get on overload too. And we also schedule in there a fair amount of quiet time for people to be quiet or to sit, to write, to read, because that sometimes, you know, in has to have a place to seed and grow while we're there. And the other thing I'm very tuned to of having done these over, over the years is that we also want when people come back home, we want that process It's kind of a ceremony and a ritual of its own have had time to be explored and open and integrated and settle in and have a time so that as you go back into the modern world, you're really able, seated well, you're really able to take that home and do something with it, right? Um, so yeah, combination of ritual, ceremony, stories like these, um, group time, individual time, um, and there's so much nature and good food and stories and arts and shopping. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the shopping actually is part of it because the amount of art and creativity and handcrafts and weaving are just, it's part of it actually, to learn about the culture and the stories, just like my top. And um, last piece I'll say is we take you to meet, you, and Wendy, you can correct me. When you come on retreats with us, you're not a tourist you come to meet and be part of the community for that period of time. And that's quite different than a lot of places where you really, you really don't get past the visitor thing. Um, And so that's one of the things we offer. It's an intimacy that I think is really, really lovely and a little crazy on occasion too. (laughs) I just texted everybody a picture of Juan at a ceremony so they could see, so they could see him. Can you Um, um, text the, uh, uh, website as well. Do you have journeys, journeys and living. And on a funny side note is, um, I used to be a brand marketer in another life. And I was like, what am I going to name this place? And da, 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 da. And so I worked on it, journeys for living, journeys of living. And then I landed on journeys in living. And really the easy way to spell it is journey, sin, living. So <laughs> that was a little error, but it's very fitting. Actually, It is. <laughs> I like it. Sin living is where you can. Uh, <laughs> I like that little naughtiness in there. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> How often do you host those? Like, what's the timelines and scheduling? Like, what do people do? Well, to be honest with this COVID thing for right now, everything is on hold. One, because country shut down, and number two, because culturally, right now, until there's some shift in this, people uh, in Guatemala right now are very afraid of outsiders. And that means people born there who left and um, people coming in. So um, even for me going back home, I can't gauge anything just yet. It's gonna pass. Um, and, and tourism is a huge part. I'm saying this for a reason down there. So 
right now everything is literally on hold. I don't feel comfortable. It's going to be 2021. Yeah. It's like that um, all over the world. Right? Yeah. It's like that all over the world, but there too, yeah. it, it, physically, you don't want to come in there unless thing, until things settle. So what I would say, what I've been telling people asking in the meantime is if you want to look at how you would form a retreat, like customized checkouts, there's some stuff on the website, call me, reach out, email me. We can start to create something and then leave the calendar dates open. I have about three people doing that right now. Um, but generally speaking, non-COVID, give me a month or two notice and off we go. <laughs> so this and is it's a silly, silly question, but what kind of cost is that? So um, accommodations and the inclusion of food is probably your single biggest cost, but on average, and it depends on how many people we have because there's certain hard costs, right? Sure. So there's there are break points. But on average, if you, uh, airlines are on your own, once you're in country, you're with me. Um, I would say, and Wendy, you guys have done this in varying degrees, is that you're probably looking lock, stock, and barrel, depending on your flights, because that, those vary a lot, is around 3,500. And the other variable is shopping. And I say that to people because I've had people over the years get upset and say, but you said it would cost this. And I'm like, you bought $600 worth of, what am I? I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. But Wendy, would you say, because the trip itself, depending on how many you have, private room, single room, inclusion of food, et cetera, is around... 2000 to 2500 per person plus it, i have right. to say it's not that expensive i mean i i did i mean lindsay and i didn't feel that way and 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 for us with the exchange rate uh you know it's not bad i mean once you get there i mean the the rooms are very inexpensive they're they're under a hundred dollars a night mm -hmm. um and uh the food the you know the food is good it's not expensive um and again it's kind of what you do with shopping but um no i don't doubt any value uh, my yeah, question yeah. is just like um and we price dance we have dance events that are the similar like once you're with us everything but, happens yeah. and, and it's d d dependent on a million things but like we go okay this is gonna be like a five-day thing you're gonna spend ten to fifteen thousand dollars and people go okay like so yeah. like range wise that's i mean if you're looking at a week twenty five hundred yeah. plus your flight yeah perfect i just wanted logistics i don't doubt any of the value i just yeah wanted. yeah no but what i thought was it it's very reasonable considering you know the amount of money that you spend to go on a different kind of vacation or what we spend like you say like it for us to go to a conference in the u.s you know lindsay and i it's, it's like ten thousand dollars for like four days right so um and and you're and you're 100 percent completely immersed in the culture um the first time we went um i remember we had done this we had done the ceremony and um as we're in the ceremony we hear this music playing and leanne's like oh it's a celebration and she said we'll, we'll go we'll go uh we'll go where they are after after we're done with our ceremony so we did <laughs> and um it was this little it was this little room i don't even know where we were i don't think it wasn't an it wasn't another cofredia i don't think yeah, it, it was, was just that it was okay yeah. so so but it, in in essence it doesn't matter it was a little room and there were all these people packed in there and there was music and people were dancing and literally the minute that we walked in um the gentleman would come up to the women and i mean i couldn't even get my backpack off and we were dancing and it was um you know they were doing their best to communicate and i was doing my best to speak spanish and um and we must have been there for like a half an hour and everybody's giving you beers and drinks and whatever and then um leanne said to us okay everybody we got to go we got to go and we got to go fast and so she gets us outside and she goes we had to leave because they wanted to feed us they wanted to bring us food and she said you know we couldn't we wouldn't have been able to say no that you know that would have been an insult and so we because we had already had lunch was being prepared for us at leanne's house so we had you know we had food and all that stuff so anyway long story short you're totally immersed in the culture 
and um and the people there are so warm and they welcome you with such open arms and they don't see you know they don't see a lot of tourists there either so that's what's really cool and you know i can't i can't speak enough about it i mean the first time we went we came back and we go oh you know that was good but i don't think i need to go every year well what happened we went back the very next year <laughs> and it was just and it was just lindsay and i so um you know we thought we might even want to we we might even want to live there part time um so you know it was uh it was definitely it was definitely worth it and uh you know i highly recommend it to anybody i loved it and i would say too just to that is we love having people and one of the the pieces that's so fun is when people bring like a group like this to say like a group of pre-existing women you already have that bond and a focus so that's one kind of experience if it's bringing um let's say somebody says hey i want to do a retreat like this and i'm going to invite some people i kind of know but you know let's see if we can get eight or ten of us to go that's a different kind of experience so we can do anywhere from individuals to three to five five is a sweet spot five to six is a sweet spot and um, those cost a little more because the overheads are the same and then you get five or above and then it changes because your transport and your experience changes, right? So the thing I would just say is it's the, the level of intimacy and the kind of community you wanna create in the process too, that's really fun to, is really fun to explore and create. It really is, it's fun. Yeah, Thank that's you. good. Um, so Leanne, can you just, kind of tell us what's happening in Santiago right now. You're not there, but you're in constant communication with them and what's happening with them with COVID and all of that. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so one of the things about a developing country um, is that our, um, the way that the virus hits is both the same as it hits everywhere else and it's different. So just, um, an example, we have our first COVID cases in, in my community as of last week. And across the country, they're spiking. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the benefits we have is that the new president who came in in January is a doctor. And so we're still really, really limited of infrastructure, but he shut the country down early. So um, overall things have, have been um, pretty good, unlike Ecuador and stuff where it's just a massive crisis. Um, but we're spiking now and so we don't know, but here's what's interesting down there and I share this because it's like the Navajo Nation here too, in some places is, so we have COVID now, they're bringing in, this was just yesterday, I was on the phone and texting with everyone, trying to get doctors in from the government to help quarantine um, the people who have been exposed in town, those who test positive are taken to a specific hospital in the city, they're removed from the community as a way to try to, uh, to manage containment. But because people live two and three generations in a house and four to five people in one sleeping room, quarantining is damn near impossible in a household there. It's, it's impossible. So we're trying to explore right now, just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with, trying to explore ways within churches or schools. The government doesn't want COVID patients in schools. Anyway, government schools to create areas where we can try to um, just have places for people to sleep and eat where they can be quarantined for the 14 days safe and comfortable um, right now, which we're struggling with, but we're getting there. We are also having massive food shortages right now because when the country shut down, tourism, agriculture, et cetera, the crisis is immediate because the average person, like in my town, makes 50 quetzales a day, that's $7, right? So you're on daily sustenance, as are people in other, other communities and cultures, no doubt, but it hits hard and it hits immediately there. So we have what's called the Oya Comunitaria, which is a group of women, and this is the fun part of this, I'll tell you. Um, are now cooking and serving about two, 300 cooked meals a day in the community. And that's really good. But we have issues now too, because with the COVID patients and the quarantining, we need sheets. People don't typically have sheets. We've been having women's collectives who typically make clothes or handcrafts shift over to making masks and now shift over to making sheets because not only are we trying to take care of the community, we're trying to support and create income in the midst of it, and it's very tricky, but 
now we've got them making sheets. Now that we have some of the sheets, we have an issue because people hand wash like in a stone big pila, we call it a sink, or in the lake shore. We don't have hot water. So now we have an issue of trying to find ways to launder <laughs> fabric, to disinfect it, to care not only for the quarantine people, but the medical professionals who are taking care of them. So again, I just share that with you because it's such an interwoven, there isn't a quick way we do this, but what I can say, um, the other thing we're managing in this and why, why food and safety and these things are so important to us is because the people in the community by and large are very afraid of outsiders right now and very afraid of those who have been exposed or who may have been exposed. There's a major fear, which is very much part of the culture thing going on. So the more stable we can keep some medical care for the crisis and some food supply for the crisis, that is actually vital to keeping the community from going on a tipping point, right? Amongst many other things, these are just where we're focused. So um, that's what we've been doing with people on the ground. Now here's the amazing part. The, the donors that we've gotten from the states, and this has just been very grassroots, we do this just, just in our own way. And by the way, there's no obligation, it's just fascinating how this has unfolded, is um, we are, I would say, 90% women or gay. <laughs> without intending to be. And the ones leading the charge on the ground is not our local municipal elected mayor. It, it's these nurses and teachers, and it's this group of 20 something Mayan women who are the first educated generation, who are lawyers and psychologists and nurses, and they are the ones that are out there getting this organized and just making it happen um, where they can in collaboration with the municipality and where they can't, they're doing an end run right around them. And that is something that has not, this is a machismo culture in many ways. And so that part, when we talk about the sacred coming in for me is just super exciting. So like right now what we're doing too is, is um, hiring women to, to prepare food to feed those women because we got to keep them going. <laughs> so so yeah, it's a, we're hitting crisis, and also there's a lot of hope and a lot of um, a lot of good, hopeful things happening. Yeah, but it's it's scary. It's really scary. Yeah. Yeah. So so if if anybody wants to um, make a contribution to um, Leanne for the the cause in Santiago, uh, you can reach out to her, and I know. We, uh, Lindsay, Lindsay coaches with Leanne um, every two weeks. So, um, you know, we pay Leanne through PayPal and uh, it's, it's pretty easy. So um, not only can you go to see Leanne in <laughs> Guatemala, but you can coach with her um, via phone and, and uh, however you want to connect, uh, however you want to connect with her, uh, you can, can do that. Thank we you. what's we WhatsApp. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And does yeah. anybody? Yeah, does anybody have any more questions for Leanne or, you know, where do you guys want to go Leanne. with this? Thank You've been you very for, generous uh, with your time. I appreciate yeah. it. It was awesome. Yeah, it's a pleasure, and I want to say thanks to Wendy and thanks to all of you because as any time and especially during this time to to. Uh, to connect and share with a group of women uh, with all of you is actually part of the prophecy itself um, mm -hmm. of creating councils of wise women and sharing. Um, so there's a um, very tender, deep part of my heart that is really grateful for, for getting to share this time. It's a, it's a, it's a special thing. And, and um, one of the agreements I made with the elders when they began to teach me was that when others came, who were wanting to remember or who were just wanting to sit in council time or to learn the stories that was my job, my obligation, meaning in a good way to share. So when I get to share with, with women like you, that's exactly what it feels mm -hmm. like. because uh, That's how we plant the gardens. And so I'm just very, very grateful. Yeah. Thank you. It's awesome. It's awesome. This has been a great, uh, Great two hours of my time spent, and, that's for sure. And if anybody and if anybody has any questions about uh, going there, 
and what it's like. Uh, I'm always happy to chat about it because I have some um, wonderfully fond memories of, of being there and, uh, and the, the whole experience. So I'm always happy to, I'm always happy to talk about it. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah. yeah and Thank anybody you. to reach out to me anytime, I, um, Facebook, email, WhatsApp is the best way to usually track me down um, for anything or just to say hi or to chat or yeah. Uh, I, that's more than welcome and I would love that, so. Awesome. Anyways, I gotta go, ladies. I have a thing at noon. All right. All right. I love you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. You. Kisses. Bye, everyone. Bye.